It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Earlier this week, Venezuela made headlines again when the International Monetary Fund announced the prediction that inflation in Venezuela will reach a staggering annual rate of 1 million percent by the end of the year. Venezuela has been going through a period of hyperinflation since late last year. Hyperinflation is usually defined as at least 50 percent uh, per month. The government of President Maduro, who was re-elected last May in a vote that most of the opposition parties boycotted, has been struggling to stop the country's massive inflation. Last Wednesday evening, Maduro announced a new set of economic reform measures. These include the introduction of a new currency to be circulated next month and then pegging this currency's value to the price of oil and loosening currency controls. The details of these policies, however, have yet to be provided. Joining me now to discuss Venezuela's economic situation and the most recent policy announcement is Sira Pascal Medina and Gregory Wilpert. Sira is political science professor at the Universidad de Bolivariana de Venezuela in Caracas and a staff writer for VenezuelaAnalysis.com. Um, Sira normally lives in Caracas, but today she's joining us from Vermont, where she is visiting at the moment. And Greg joins us from Quito, Ecuador. He is a host and producer here at The Real News Network and the author of the book, Changing Venezuela by Taking Power, The History and Policies of Chavez Government. I thank you both for joining us today. Thank you, Chairman. All right, um, uh, Sira, let me start with you first. You have been living in Venezuela for several years now. How is daily life uh, in terms of conditions of hyperinflation and how it's affecting you living there on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, uh, I've been in Venezuela since 2006, and so I've seen a broader spectrum of the whole process. I've seen the beautiful period early on and now we are living a rather difficult situation day to day basically uh, you have explained the situation with inflation and uh, with for instance to get uh, precise about the living conditions of a venezuelan a salary a minimum salary a regular salary of a venezuelan uh, perhaps buys you a kilo of meat, a monthly salary. So that's very a very grave situation. Of course, many people are working other forms of solving their daily problems, like, well, many people have immigrated and those who stay in Venezuela receive remittances from their families. So it has generated a creative form of solving problems, but the day-to-day -day life in Venezuela is very difficult. There are problems from, in everything from getting, you know, like cash, physical cash, to uh, solving medical problems, etc., etc. So, for instance, in the very briefly, in the last few days, we have seen a series of protests that are not anti-government protests, that are not uh, protests that point to changing the government as they were last year, but protests that point to solving the profound problems that Venezuelans are living day to day. All right, Greg, let's go to you. What exactly are these new economic measures all about? And describe the main ones uh, to us so that uh, we can see the impact the government hopes they will have uh, by introducing this policy. Well, perhaps the first and most important policy is uh, to introduce a new currency, as was mentioned in the introduction, that uh, will basically, I mean, it's a, a currency that uh, only, uh, that uh, knocks off five zeros from uh, the, uh, from the Bolivar, the, what the name of the currency is. No? And um, so that means, uh, in other words, one million Bolivares will become 10 Bolivares. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's, of course, mainly going to make, a sim make life simpler because you don't have to deal in these hum humongous denominations. Perhaps more importantly, but also a little bit less predictably as to what the effect will be, is uh, that this currency is supposed to be pegged to 
um, a new currency, a parallel currency that uh, the government introduced actually earlier this year, which is known as the Petro, uh, which is supposed to be tied to the price of Venezuelan oil basket. And so currently one Petro is supposed to equal $60. Now, <clears throat> exactly how it will be tied and what that means is a little bit up in the air. But if it were to, to be tied in, a, in an effective way, that is, that would actually allow people to uh, trade uh, the Bolivares for Petro and the Petro for dollars, uh, that is on a free way without a, a strict control, then it, that could actually stop hyperinflation. But that's what we don't know yet, is to exactly how uh, tightly it will be controlled to the, uh, tied to the value of uh, the oil basket. Uh, so that's a real big unknown. Then there were several other, uh, perhaps less important uh, changes uh, that have been introduced. One is to reform the law on uh, the uh, illicit exchange, that is the illegal or black market trading uh, in the currency. Uh, presumably it will loosen those laws, so that it will make it easier and less illegal to uh, deal with that exactly how we don't know yet. And then another one is to uh, assign uh, the, uh, the oil reserves and to a section of the oil reserves to the central bank, meaning that, in other words, the central bank's balance sheet would mention or would include uh, some of Venezuela's oil reserves. And now, exactly what effect that will have is also difficult to say because that oil hasn't been produced yet. It's still in the ground. So how much is it worth? Well, that's a little bit difficult to say. So those are just a couple of, uh, of the measures which uh, you know, the government obviously hopes will stop hyperinflation, but I think the devil is in the details and we don't know yet, obviously, if that will actually happen. All right, Sarah. Now, people in Venezuela have been living under uh, this kind of uh, inflation and uh, this isn't the first time that the government has tried to take control of it. What are the people in Venezuela uh, talking about with regard to the government's economic policies? How are they being received and how are they coping with it in terms of um, actually uh, buying and selling and how is commerce con conducted in the country? Well, in terms of how the measures have been received, I mean, uh, the, um, there have been measures, there have been attempts to put in place measures uh, through the crisis. And so people are sort of lukewarm every time that there's a bunch of announcements. Now, uh, Greg was mentioning the measure of tying the Bolivar to the Petro. And that has generated a little bit of expectations. I personally think that it's more a symbolic measure than a, a real concrete measure that will have an impact because uh, for it to actually uh, work, the state, the government would have to be able to place dollars. So there would have to be the possibility of circling from Bolivars to Petros to dollars with the participation of the state in placing the dollars. So actually placing the dollars in the market, offering the dollars, but the, the state has limited dollars. So uh, that one measure has created some expectation. What is day to day life in Venezuela? Well, with an economy that is, uh, that is highly inflationary, basically uh, what we, and with, uh, let's say perspectives on the horizon that are not radical in terms of transformation, and later we can go into that. Basically, people are looking for individual solutions. People are making tremendous, uh, people are actually uh, committing themselves, of course, to solving the problems of the, of the families. Um, but uh, the, the collective solutions that, from my perspective, would be the solutions that would take us out of the current crisis are not kind of like in the collective horizon. And I think they're not in the collective horizon because the collective solution is the commune and the government does not seem to place a, a great deal imp of importance in the communal project in this moment. So basically, logically, what we see is a great deal of individualism uh, simultaneously with sacrifices, fam families sacrificing themselves. So many people are going out of the country to send remittances to their families. That is, of course, a sacrifice. Mothers making long queues to get food in supermarkets. That is a sacrifice. They are sacrifices that are individual or for the family. 
and the collective horizon is not on the table at this moment. All right, Greg, let's uh, take a step back and look at uh, what impact U.S. financial sanctions are having on Venezuela. To what extent are they contributing to the economic crisis that they're feeling on the ground? I would say they would, they're definitely having a major impact. Um, but uh, the crisis itself, that is the hyperinflation spiral, I think we need to be clear about that, was not started by the sanctions. Uh, that's something that one has to be clear. And so, uh, of course, there's other things. I mean, the government talks about an economic war against Venezuela, and it's talking specifically about the local uh, elites, you know, smuggling and uh, being involved in currency speculation and all of that, which is certainly also happening. But in terms of the U.S. sanctions, they've had a secondary effect in the sense that they've uh, made certain conditions worse. And one of the uh, first ones is, of course, the shortages, because it's become much more difficult to import things. The sanctions right now uh, are kind of specific, but they become have a ripple effect. That is, they specifically target uh, trading in Venezuelan debt. Uh, that, is, uh, that is, U.S. citizens and people living in the U.S. are not allowed to trade in Venezuelan debt. And since so many transactions are made on the basis of debt, it pretty much uh, freezes up all financial tra transactions of Venezuela that uh, go through the United States. So, uh, for example, Venezuela has been, uh, sorry, the United States banks have been closing Venezuelan bank accounts th uh, across the board, making it impossible or very difficult for Venezuela to import anything from the United States even. Um, and uh, preventing, and this is also a major impact, preventing the sending of um, of, um, uh, of the profits from Citgo, which you know the uh, Venezuelan uh, oil company owns, sending those uh, those dividends to Venezuela is uh, basically illegal at the moment. And so Venezuela can't pay for many of the imports, uh, either through the dividends of Citgo or through taking on uh, additional debt. Also, it cannot restructure its existing debt. Normally, when a government has uh, debt, and Venezuela has a significant amount of debt, um, they can roll over that debt and uh, just pay the interest. Well, in the Venezuelan case, they cannot. Uh, they, and so that means they have to pay off the principal. So it means the debt payments, the annual debt payments, are way higher than they normally would be for most ordinary countries that don't uh, aren't going through these kinds of sanctions. So, so in other words, it's making uh, and causing basically a, a large, larger expenses to flow out of Venezuela for the debt payment, and it's making imports more difficult and complicated because of the freezing of bank accounts. All right, Greg. Now, if these latest measures to get control of inflation doesn't work, and hyperinflation and shortages continue, what else can the government do? Uh, for the people of Venezuela. Well, this is, of course, a hotly debated issue within Venezuela, and there's many disagreements, and many people have different perspectives on this. Uh, my own personal perspective is that Venezuela ought to uh, liberate the exchange rate in order to, uh, and this is the way traditionally hyperinflation is stopped. I, I wish the government would look at other examples of uh, hyperinflation, and the only way to really stop it is to introduce a new currency that is not uh, that does not go through at least for a period. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not saying that it can't ever go back to a currency control, but right now the currency control is specifically what's causing all of these distortions, at least in my analysis, uh, because it's creating so many opportunities for arbitrage, for, for basically uh, speculating on the currency, and also creating a lot of um, corruption in the process. And so the first step, I think, is uh, to get rid of the, uh, the fixed exchange rate, uh, and, that's, uh, and that means also introducing a new... Uh, a new currency. That's why my hope is that this new currency, which is supposed to be introduced in August, will make a difference. But it all depends, like both Sierra and I have said already, uh, whether or not that uh, con that connection to the Petro is actually connected to, uh, to a real market where people can actually get something of value outside of the country uh, for that. If not, there's just going to be a new black market for uh, Petros and for the new Bolivar. So, and that won't really solve the problem. So uh, that's really the main thing, I would say. All right. If I can add something. Yes, of course, Sarah, go ahead. So, I, of course, I think that there have to be macroeconomic measures, and I agree that there has to be a liberalization of the currency that, of course, creates a lot of, uh, a lot of Chavistas uh, are wary of doing that because the, the, the limits, let's say, on exchange were set in place by Chavis. But right now, the the currency, let's see, policy cannot stay as it is. But I would go further. I would say that, for instance, 
Venezuela has to look into entering the fault in terms of the debt. The Venezuela has the most expensive debt in the world. Venezuela cannot go on paying this debt. And actually, Venezuela has been defaulting in a disorganized way in the payments of the debt. So another issue that has to be brought to the table, at least discussed, is doing an organized default. But beyond that, what I would say is that we have to change the rules of the game. That is the most important thing. All these uh, macroeconomic measures are necessary, but they don't mean changing the rules of the game. Changing the rules the, of the game in a situation that is very extreme means really jumping to another kind, to a reorganization of the society. And Chavez had a plan for that, which was the commune. So I believe that if macroeconomic measures don't go hand on hand with a real commitment, with the communes, with this radical, popular, direct democracy and social property reorganization of the territory, which has worked in some instances, then the macroeconomic measures might work to normalize the situation. But normalizing the situation in a country of the global South is not enough. Normalizing the, the situation in a country of the normal, normal South could mean that your inflation is not so high, but that doesn't mean that there's not going to be poverty. And this project, the Chavista project, is a, a project that aims to create sovereignty, but also the emancipation of human beings in, in a project that we call socialism, Bolivarian socialism, or socialism of the 21st century, which corrects the errors, uh, let's say perhaps uh, somewhat authoritarian errors, non-democratic errors of 20th century socialism. All right, Sarah, Pascal, Medina, and Gregory Wilpert, I thank you both for joining us today. Obviously, this needs to be a more in-depth conversation. Um, there's so much more to be said and analyzed here. Uh, but for now, I thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.